Welcome to City Life. It's great to have you with us today. Today on the program, the future of healthcare in New Zealand, dealing with hunger, when and what to eat, a book review about the famous Dunedin family, the Larnix, and health and fitness with Bevan James Isles. But first on the program, Anthony Goff. Always good to have you here. Wonderful, thank you very much. And I see you've brought along a whole pile, 30 in fact, of photos. Yes, well I've been in the red zone, that's why I'm dressed this way today, you see. Red. And... <laughs> You're looking good, suave as usual. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so what have, what have you been up to lately? So you've been in the red zone? Yes, well, at, at the moment there's still a lot of demolition going on and one of the buildings that I'm involved in is called Poplar's and Oasis Restaurant, very personal type of thing. That There's an eight storey building, that I didn't just have to take the top layer off, I haven't take the whole lot and I'm showing you what happens with these photographs of bringing a building down and how you clean it inside out and everything else so that's quite good. I picked on the also the city mall because that's going to be the, the restart that's where the first part of the city will reopen mm -hmm. 29th of October yep. days are coming closer yes. nothing will stop us good. Um, but huge swathes of open area but I've also shown you areas that will be living afterwards that are still things you'll recognise. So we're seeing some that are going and some that are staying and it's really worthwhile. And I've drawn all over the pictures so that <laughs> not only do you get to hear what I'm saying, yeah. but hopefully you can follow some of my little doodlings and signs and that sort of thing. Okay, shall we have a look at them? Certainly. Because it's good actually when you come in because you bring in a whole host of photos which we can't see yet. Yes, Parts exactly. Parts of which we can't see. Okay, so... Right, okay. So the first photo we can have a look at here, this is, as you can see, it says Manchester Street, High and Litchfield Corner. And this is actually outside the Excelsior Hotel. And anyone for coffee? You can see the coffee <laughs> cups. They were actually removed off that, but other places in town, they're everywhere. So, still, it looks okay, but actually, let's look at the next slide. We'll roll on to these. This is the same picture, just a little further over. That's the corner of Litchfield and High Street. Excelsior Hotel in the background, that'll be coming down. So, that was what was called the ANZ Corner and had world um, clothing in it. Um, this is the same corner, but just turn the background and look straight up High Street to the towards the square, and you'll see the corner building, Java Cafe. You'll see oh. it's coming down. Oh. You'll also see that I put sort of X's and ticks around the place. Everything you've already see there. That X is is the Westpac building. Is that coming down? Yep. Oh. So I'm told um, the hotel here, where my finger is, is going to be staying. That's the. Um, uh, ho um, what is that one now? It's the one opposite <laughs> Holiday the Inn. Holiday, Holiday Inn. Inn. But unfortunately, it's still in the full zone, so it won't yeah. open for a year or two. Okay. But it's okay. Um, so, so, so that was looking down Litchfield Street, and there right. won't be terribly much left in it. Now you're um, in your car, aren't you? I can see you yes. actually taking a photo. Yes, because my pass allows me to be in three separate areas, but I somehow get lost on my way around town. Oh, I'm sure you do. <laughs> I know you got a red pass, but <laughs> yes. so, but so, and you do get met. You meet trucks and excavators, so you do have to sort of tour around to try and get to your location. Now, this is actually very close to this intersection. I'm just I, these are in patches. These photos. So this is Litchfield. Field Street, looking as you can see the Grand Chancer. Do you see I've drawn an arrow down that building? And that arrow, the whole building has actually slumped. And if you look, those windows aren't horizontal. I'll try and turn this more direct on. Is that better? Yes. There we go. And so if we're looking here, well, it's down here, yep. you'll find that the windows have are not horizontal. And that's where oh. the buildings actually moved. And to generate, that here we're seeing right through the Bedford Road from Manchester Street. That's the New Life's majestic New Life Centre. OK, so we're on Bedford Road now. Looking no, we're on Litchfield. Litchfield. Looking oh towards Bedford Road. So you're doing street scenes where you look straight through the block to the next road now. I just wouldn't even recognise that if I was walking through there. So that's why I thought it was worth writing names on things. Mm. Here, this is, this is Litchfield Street. Um, it's the back of the old civic chambers yep. in the background. Um, is that Winnie Bay goes on the left, the uh, right, I mean, the old Winnie Bay goes? Uh, no, this is in Litchfield Street. Litchfield. I'm so confused. Yes, so I've got behind <laughs> me is the, is the bus exchange where I'm oh, sitting. Oh, OK. But the interest, you look at these and you can't see in that photo, but there's a toilet sitting up on the wall, just positioned way up in the air. If we have a look, just come back this way. There. Oh my gosh. That's a toilet sitting up there. So wonderful sights you see all around town. And then I just turned my background, and that's what I was, was right behind me. So there's a couple of cars that have come out of the town museum. I'm not certain where the big teddy bear came from. <laughs> and there's the bus exchange, which has got some serious problems on the facade. Yeah. But I think the bus exchange car park's okay, and the bus exchange itself 
or crossing is okay. Here, this this was an early photo um, it, of Manchester Street iconic bar in the old Civic that was right beside it. You can see the car park on the extreme right, the other side from okay, one Okay, now I was confused before with the Civic Chambers and there's this Civic building. Okay, got you. That was the original Civic <laughs> um, yes, offices. On long Manchester time ago. Street, got yep. you. Okay. That's it now. <gasps> Um, and an interesting thing, this is Gloucester Street looking side on, but it's oh the Civic in it and Iconic on the right. You'll notice there's, I pointed a little red thing there, that's actually a, a cruncher that breaks up bricks and concrete and turns it into little pebbles. Oh so you can gosh. see them just pouring it all Amazing. through it there at the moment. So that's what's happening in Centre City. Do you notice there's a total lack of people? There are no, there's tractors and that, but nobody else in town. Mm. Here, this, this is a site, you'll see, that where, that's where the CTV was, mm -hmm. Arrow International beside it. I'm Latimer Square's behind me. You're looking at the IRD building, which looks fine, and you've got um, Les Mills on the right, which I think is fine. You'd mm -hmm. be talking to him a little later on. Um, so this is what you'll, it will look like when, you, when the city opens. Okay. Um, this, I was talking about uh, my Poplars and Oasis yes. restaurant. This is what Oasis restaurant looks like. I'd speak okay, that is incredible. Was anybody in there? Yes. At the time? And so yes, this but, is but afterwards, no, is this? This is, this is during demolition. Okay. So this is what um, $3 million of my money looks like now. Oh. Um, of renovations, the building's worth $15 million, okay. and it's been torn apart at the moment. So that's what my kitchen looked like, and this is what my kitchen looks like now. Oh. Um, so I don't really want to look at this. Some no. expensive fridges and stoves and everything there we just couldn't get out. Yeah. This is what it looks like being torn apart at the moment. So what they do is they pull the innards out of the hotel, out of these buildings, totally clean them out, and then they turn around and they demolish them. But mm -hmm. the outside cladding's got polystyrene all over it. This is, this is what Whitcrawls looked like. I've circled where the, you'll see these cracks and walls and a hole in the side of the wall. This is what Whitcrawls looks like now. Oh, my goodness. Opposite Ballantines. Here we are. This is... This is what Cashel Street, there, the building, see the ones what? I've X'd and crossed? Yeah, what are those ones? NZI is the white one. Mm. The far away one is Clarendon Towers. The ticked one was the bus exchange. Okay. Then you've got, this is Shades Arcade, you'll see it's missing. Um, mm. That's, there's just one column close to me, that would have gone by now. Mm. And then here we're looking towards the Bridge of Remembrance down Cashel Street, so this is what you'll look. You'll see on the left is oh, Ballantines. Yeah, Ballantines, and that's it. And there's not much else. Um, this is um, opposite, with well, Ballantyne's on, on the left there, I presume it's the left, what you're looking at, mm -hmm. and we've got Guthrie Centre's going, I've written Tower Park there where my friend was, mm -hmm. That's the, so we're now seeing through to other streets. This is turning around and looking straight up towards the Bridge of Remembrance in the distance. Mm -hmm. You'll see that green building hole on the side, that's going to come down. We're looking through to Litchfield Street car park, which is OK. And then this is what's, what my buildings in Cashel Street looked like. Mm -hmm. And this is the back view of them, as you can see, roofs and top floors fell off things. And um, this is now what they look like. In the distance, you'll see that's what DTZ looks like. Oh, gosh. Um, looking down Cashel Street, buildings on the right will all stay. There's we are, what they look like, and they'll look like that. This is what my office looks like. That's where my seat was. Oh, I wasn't in it, thank goodness. Thank goodness. This is Colombo Street looking towards the square. Those are mostly going to stay. Okay. Colombo Street looking towards the hills, mostly going to stay. Okay. This is Cashel Street, activity like Billio, that same intersection. Yeah. Those buildings either side are all going to stay. So this is, and we've come to in our photos. So there's parts will be okay and parts that won't. Amazing. Now it's, it's good that you've got this red pass and that you get lost. I hope you don't get in trouble for that. No, no, no. I've just got it renewed for three months. You won't believe they said I was a good boy. I didn't get out of my car. I might have got lost. But I, and it's terrible. Everyone's going to get lost in the centre city. That's right. <laughs> now, the, um, all those buildings gone in Cashel Mall, I mean, you've, you've shown us the before and the after. It looks like the restart 2019-11, will, there will be something to, to yes, build on. The great excitement th is that that big site, you see the Whitcrawl site and the mm. Guthrie Centre, that's actually going to have a whole lot of temporary structures all over it. Mm. Very, very exciting. Yeah. It's all going to be fashion. There's 30 or 40 shops going in there. Yep. Really exciting sort of thing. So mm. I'll be able to bring you up to date with that as it gets a little closer. Looking We've got 30 it. or 40 containers on the water at the moment oh, really? coming to Christchurch from China.
Excellent. So it's not going to be those big glass houses? It's going to be the containers? Oh, I might have some glass houses as well. Oh. We've got all sorts of options <laughs> coming. But there are, there are 30 to 40 containers on a ship at the moment okay. coming for this job. Excellent. Anthony, great to see Thank you. Thank you very much. After the break, we chat about the future of healthcare in New Zealand. with City Life and I'd like to welcome Ian from Southern Cross Healthcare. Good to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. Now you are on the road at the moment celebrating 50 years of Southern Cross. Yeah, in 1961 Southern Cross was started. We had uh, less than a thousand members then. We've now got uh, 835,000 members and we're going around the country talking about what Southern Cross is going to get up to for the next 50 years because we wanted to be around for my kids and my grandkids. Definitely, and it's definitely something to celebrate. 50 years is a good, a good amount of time to be around. Yeah, and we know a bit about healthcare now, and we're a sort of fundamental part of New Zealand's health system, and uh, I think we're going to have an even more important role in the future. You know, we're, uh, we're very important as, uh, as a major provider of elective surgery. I think that'll get a little bit broader as time goes on. It's going to be really tough for government, for everybody to afford the health care that uh, they know they want and they deserve uh, as costs just go up and up. Mm. 50 years, what's the secret to your success? Well, I think there's, there's a lot of, uh, lot of things in there. One of them is that our sort of philosophy of not-for-profit and our philosophy of um, being very ethical and uh, managing um, our, our brand very well, I think uh, they're, they're really important. We're very consistent. We, you know, we do an orientation with all the staff and they're all told that we're there to get better health care for people. We mm. don't do it to make money. How have you evolved over the years? Well, yeah, that, that's interesting. We started off as a health insurer. We had two claims in the first year. Uh, last year, I think we had 580,000 claims. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, nearly $600 million of, of claims. And so, but we've moved on. We're now New Zealand's largest uh, private hospital chain. We have uh, 17 hospitals across the country, a big one here in Christchurch, which uh, we're very proud of and very pleased that it could play its part. And when you had troubled times here, mm. um, we, we also uh, run New Zealand's uh, most interesting and growing travel insurance business. Uh, which is mostly online and a sort of very dynamic, good value business. We're now into primary care, general practice. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's a really interesting one. I think that's going to be the glue that holds all this together. Mm. One, of the, one of the things we're saying at this, uh, these celebrations of 50 years is that we've grown up a bit and we're a group of businesses now. Don't just think of us as an insurer, think of us as a, a full suite of services because uh, that's the way we're going to be able to get best value, mm. I think, for people. Now you are on the road, you're holding sort of public events, yep. and uh, including here in Christchurch. Yep. Tell us about those events. Yeah, about uh, 200 odd people are turning up to them uh, at least. We've got Kevin Milne who's uh, a fascinating guest speaker and he's had a few uh, interesting and difficult health problems of his own which are uh, a um, bit of a plug but he's, he's uh, very grateful he had health insurance and uh, got his uh, heart problem treated, his pituitary gland treated. He's got some uh, funny and entertaining stories. I can't really be responsible for his stories but <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's quite entertaining and uh, quite topical so uh, he, he's part of it and then I talk about uh, where Southern Cross is uh, uh, gone and going and I talk about uh, wanting it to be around uh, as I say for my grandkids mm. then we have morning tea. Oh wow, yeah. <laughs> that's a good idea <laughs> to go along. Yeah. So how do you think our health care in New Zealand is, is evolving? I mean is it changing over the years? Yeah I think yes it is and um, you know, there's more and more that we can do and as we get an ageing population there's more and more people need and that's going to be matched with fewer and fewer people to pay for it. Mm. And so uh, we don't have that problem on our own, but healthcare costs go up at a much greater rate than, uh, than normal inflation. Okay. And that's, go that's going to be a problem. And I think uh, you'll see organisations and, and like us really concentrating on how to get the best value. You know, we really want to work with the public system so both parts um, get the most efficient, best value care. I think, I think that how it's going to evolve is, is, is going to be quite interesting. I think it's going to be quite a tension there. 
yes, we can do that, but can we afford it? Mm. And, you know, we have organisations like Pharmac, which, which do a great job in uh, sort of analysing the cost of drugs and getting the best possible deal for New Zealanders. Mm. That's, I think, the role for Southern Cross in the future. Mm. And why, that's why we're working with general practice. I think if we can partner with people who know, you know, the medical profession and, and, and do it in a way that, uh, that works in the best ethical, clinical way. That, mm. But it's going to be tricky times ahead, I think. Mm, I think yeah. so. And it, it's not for everybody, is it? I mean, people can't, not a lot of people can pay for extra insurance. No, and well, in my, th my theory, I often talk about my, my mother. She would never have dreamed that I would have to be saving for my retirement. Mm. As, as probably you are, mm. you know, and Kiwi Savers here, yeah, you know, the right. government's going to take care of that. Mm. I, I reckon uh, it's going to be hard for the government to to pay for and tax New Zealanders for all our non-urgent health care. Mm. So I think, you know, your generation, my kids' generation are going to have to be saving for their health care as well. And then I think you need some organisations to help them with it. It's a real tricky problem. Mm. And yeah. are these issues being discussed at the roadshows? Yeah, we, yes, and, and not only discussed by us, but it's interesting, it's coming out from the audience. Okay. And, and people get that and, and are worried about that. And mm. I think there'll be more and more discussions on a national level about that and can you use KiwiSaver in that environment. Mm. You know, the, lots of things. It's going to be an interesting time. I'm pleased that Southern Cross is hale and hearty and mm. going to be there to take a responsible role in that. Ian, really good to have you on the programme Thank today. You. Congratulations on the 50 years. Yeah, I haven't and been there for 50 years. <laughs> I didn't think that for one minute. And good luck for the next 50. Will Thank you be you there for the next much. 50? I hope so. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks. Have fun. Bye. Now, after the break, we deal with hunger. You're back with City Life, and I'd like to welcome back to the program Dr. Rodney Ford. Now, I see you've brought some excellent props with you today, and I love props and chocolate biscuits. So, tell me, what's this? <laughs> what's happening here? <laughs> this is the series Every Mouthful Matters, mm. and the question we're looking at today is why am I dying of hunger? Mm. And I saw a boy, Timothy, not long ago, brought him with his mother. He's eight years old. He's a little bit chunky, mm -hmm. and mother's worried that he's eating the wrong foods. But Timothy, at eight, he just wants to eat food. Mm. And so I wanted to explain why Timothy's hungry and what mum could do. OK, first of all, we should talk about why do we get hungry? Well, we get hungry because if we don't eat, we die, and our brain has to be full of glucose. If we get low in glucose, the body thinks it's going to die, so we're desperate to eat, and mm. we eat what's available. That's right. Now, the body craves what it needs, but what if it says it's still hungry? Well, Timothy has got about a trillion cells in his body, so we imagine that this is a cell. Okay. And it's hungry. Right. A trillion of them he's got to feed every day, giving all the nutrients that he wants. Okay. And so we say to Timothy, here's a snack, Timothy. What would you like? Would you like a chocolate biscuit or would you like an apple? Now, Timothy knows he should eat the apple. His mother has said he should eat the apple. Mm. His brain is saying, go for the biscuits. Yeah. Timothy and Kenita say, <laughs> go for the biscuits. Everybody likes <laughs> a chocolate biscuit. And the problem is this, is that chocolate biscuit is full of sugar. We've got this, this uh, is a model of sugar, OK? OK. And we need this to feed our brains. Chocolate biscuits are full of sugar. And when you eat them, the sugar is very quickly absorbed. Mm. How do you do that? Well, this is Timothy's pancreas. Okay. okay. And in the pancreas is insulin. And insulin is released from Timothy's pancreas to click onto the sugar to get it into his cell. You can't get this stuff, glucose, mm. into your cells without insulin. Okay. And the problem that Timothy's done, he's munched up his chocolate biscuits. Mm. He's got all this sugar going through his system. His pancreas is making all this <laughs> insulin. Yeah. And when it's finished doing its job, he's still got insulin over. Uh -uh. Because the, there's a lag between eating the chocolate biscuit and pumping out the insulin. Okay. So the insulin is beginning to suck out the important glucose in his blood, and he is feeling he's going to die again with hunger because he's made to hung be hungry by the insulin. Mm. So he wants more. So what should he do? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah. What should he do? Well, Mother says, eat the apple. Mm. And he doesn't want to eat the apple because his brain tells him to eat this. So yeah. we need to eat 
with knowledge and not with knowing we're hungry. And the apple has the glucose put in a matrix of fibre. And when you eat this, it doesn't just suddenly dissolve. The body's got to pull it apart. And there, ah, oh, there's some glucose. Fibre. Oh, there's some glucose. And it's a slow release mechanism okay. so that the pancreas, when it produces its insulin, it keeps up and it perfectly puts it into the cells and it doesn't give them a sugar rush. Okay. So that is why people are asked to eat apples, mm -hmm. fruit, vegetables, coloured stuff, not sugar. Okay. And if we <laughs> manage to have our sugar in fresh fruits and vegetables, then we're not going to get that sugar rush and not get that hunger craving. Okay. How do we know when to stop eating then? When do we know when to stop eating the apples? <laughs> exactly. Well, when you eat this, it takes quite a while to chew. Mm. And it takes a while for the stomach to deal with it. It gives you the sugar slowly, and you know that you're not going to eat 10 or 20 of these. Mm. This is quick to eat. Mm -hmm. You keep on munching it, you get the sugar rush, you keep on being hungry, and you never know when to stop eating. We need to take our clues from the natural fruit and vegetables. Manufacturers are interested in selling biscuits for a profit. We should be interested in eating food for health. Okay, so when do we know when to stop eating the healthy food at least? Is that when because we get you, full? Or? Yeah, when you get full. And I went to a beautiful seminar with a lady who said, eat three quarters full. We're used to eating everything on the plate, especially mm. when it's a free thing and you think, well, I better eat all the food I can because it's free. Mm. We need to think, we don't need all that food. Eat handful portions. Don't fill your plate too full. If you see a lot of food on your plate, you're probably going to eat it. Mm. So well, I would suggest that people plan ahead, know what foods they're going to eat and how much they're going to eat and get conditioned to eat the right amount of food at the right time, at the right pace. Don't okay. rush your food. Now, I know that everyone is thinking, and so am I, do we have to give up the sweet treats? Can we have sweet <laughs> treats have still? Have the naughty treats. Absolutely you can. <laughs> food is a thing we love to do together, mm. treats and things. And the problem is that once you start eating these biscuits, people can eat a whole packet. I'm sure you've got friends who do that. I'm sure you've probably <laughs> friends, got yeah. friends. <laughs> yeah, I've got lots of friends who do that. <laughs> and it's hard to stop because mm. of this insulin pumping through your system. So again, if you eat with knowledge and know that if you just have a small amount, and you know that when you eat a piece of chocolate, it's that melty feeling in your mouth, that beautiful feeling. And once you've had that, you want that feeling in your mouth again. Mm -hmm. It's not, once you swallowed it, it's over. <laughs> you want to keep them eating it. Mm. So if you cut up things into small chunks and eat them and savour them and enjoy that and say, well, I'm going to have two blocks, two squares, not mm. <laughs> two squares, and eat it slowly, yeah. then you're going to enjoy the sweet treat without having too much. OK, Dr Rodney Ford, always good to have you on the programme as part of your series, Every Mouthful Matters. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. After the break, we catch up with Bevan James Isles. City Life, and it's always my pleasure to welcome Bevan James Isles and I'm to City very Life. excited today, you know what? <laughs> always. You're always excited, well, though. Well, I know I am excited, more character, but extra excited today because the latest edition of CC. Which one am I on? We're on this one here. Look at this. <laughs> Karen Walker, legend. Why is she a legend? Because she's coming to Merivale. Oh, is she? Yeah. Is she coming? You'll see. Oh, you just have to open up CC there? magazine. I'm going to Merivale as well then because Carol Walker's going to be yes. there. But this month I did an article in this great magazine. I have to say you're doing a good job with this, Meg. It's looking yeah, good. It's pretty sharp. It's looking sharp. So, someone needs a pay rise, I think. <laughs> just, uh, Thank you very much. I did an article and you were going to ask me, so I'm just going to tell you. So last month I talked about obstacles and how to overcome obstacles. And this month I've actually given a technique or a, a process to think about mm. before you actually exercise. Mm. And that I'm going to talk about in this article about how a lot of athletes spend 90% of their time on the physical and bugger mm. on the mental. Mm -hmm. And if they were to spend more time on the mental, maybe they'd get better results from their training. Mm. So in this article, I kind of talk about maybe here's a process that you can use before you train to see if you can get more from your sessions. So. It was a, actually that that column made me think a lot. Oh, good. Yeah, no, it was good. So CC That's magazine. My job, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's CC magazine. Yeah. <laughs> it's out now. If you can't find a coffee, you can find us online, cbc.co.nz. Anyway, what are you here to talk more about? about me, today? Yeah. <laughs> but um, it was about you. Oh, okay, it was too. You keep talking. <laughs> um, no, I think the thing I'm going to talk about today, and, and it's a bit of a. a a subject that's kind of close to heart. I had, a, I had a talk with a girl a while ago. I had a friend, I'm going to tell a story. Okay. I had a friend and she 
she had a, a sister who was overweight and, you know, I'm the fitness dude, so she said, can you talk to my sister about her weight issues? And so I kind of went up for coffee with this girl and we sat down and she started telling me about her problems and, and in my mind I was trying to find solutions to the typical male thing to do with these <laughs> solutions, you know, oh, well, here's what you need to do. And, uh, and so, and I kind of started to come at her for solutions and, and everything I talked about, she would have an excuse for why that wouldn't work for her. Mm. And after a while it actually made sense to me that I wasn't doing my job in this role. My job was to try to understand her world and then to try to figure out to support her to move, make change in this world, not to actually have the answers because that wasn't going to work. And eventually, once I shifted my thinking from I need to have the answers to I need to have understanding, mm. I realised that she just hated herself. Aww. Yeah, it was really sad. And, and I kind of just, I eventually just said, you know, you're not a bad person because you're overweight. And she kind of broke down and cried. And, and I think that a lot of the harm of the image that we're sold in the world today, mm. it's, uh, there are a lot of people out there who, who just don't fit that. And, mm. and let's be honest, 90% of the population don't fit the image that we're sold. Mm. And that, that creates a lot of self dislike and I just don't know if that's a healthy thing mm. and and I so I don't know if I really have any answer for today but I just mm. kind of think that if you're sitting in that place where because of the way you, you look if that makes you dislike yourself then maybe there's some you need to spend some time on removing some of the things that make you dislike yourself and trying to find ways that are going to make you feel more positive about yourself because mm. if you hate yourself because of the, the way you look in the mm. mirror and you see yourself is that going to move you towards change that, you know? And, and, and if anything, you find where people are irrational, they tend to make emotional decisions and they tend to be negative emotional decisions. So when you dislike yourself, you tend to go to an, an irrational place. And so, you know, then you start to feel emotionally bad about yourself. So then you need a bag of, you know, pick a bucket of biscuits because mm. you're feeling bad about yourself, mm. which then takes you further down that path okay. of dislike. And, and so, I don't, you know, I don't know if I have the answer for this one, but if you do feel a sense of, kind of dislike of self just mm. because of your image, maybe start you know, some of your energy is to focus on how can you then move yourself away from the things that are influencing that. Okay. So, you know, like sometimes, you know, if, you, if you're watching TV programs where they're promoting image too much or you're, you're exposing yourself to some type of media that's that way or mm. if you have friends who pick, are too self-critical of their own image, mm. you know, those types of things, there are, and there are certain environments that actually try to promote. They're like I know mm. of my business, with my running businesses, if you go to my website, it's not about the beautiful people, it's mm. about real people. Mm. And, and that's really important to me because I don't want to promote, I've never been big on promoting image. I don't think that's the key thing with exercise. Mm. I think exercise actually teaches you about mind, it teaches you about self. And some of the benefits of that is that you get an image you can be proud of, but I don't know if chasing image is the goal. Mm. And I know that's not going to sit with a lot of people. I know a yeah. lot of people I do want the image, but if you're in a place where you just genuinely dislike yourself because of what you see in the mirror, is that going to move you towards doing exercise? That's really sad. Yeah, that's that really sad. But I, you know, I think there are a lot of people out there who feel that way. But I think it's also about distancing yourself from watching those programs, picking up these magazines, except for CC because yeah, it's well, all... That's, that's no, it's good. It's got my article, it which grows you. Yeah. It doesn't make you feel bad about <laughs> no, yourself. No, no, but and there's, there's real people in there yeah, as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, but like, if you look at most marketing, you know, it's all been photoshopped, it's all been yeah. airbrushed, it's, it's not real people. Mm. You know, if you're going to compare yourself, compare yourself to people in your world. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then and look to the people in your world who have made adjustments. Like, mm. I always think that the... You know, we can watch the Tiger Woods of the world or the Michael Jordans and we can think, wow, they're amazing and they can be inspiring, but they're not really in touch with us. Mm. Whereas if your best mate suddenly loses a few kgs, you know, what are they doing well? And maybe mm. you should look to them to yeah. be inspiration and to be support. And do you know what I think your friend's sister should do? What's that? Join us all on the uh, Get, Get Up, up to, to Five. five. You're yeah. in, are you? Yeah. You're committed, nice. Yeah, 28th of August. Yes, you're in. Starting on a Sunday. No, seminar. First seminar. Oh, seminar. Yeah, we're going to have a seminar because we're going to talk about education as well. So oh, yeah, we have yeah. our first seminar on yeah. the 28th yeah. and then we start training on the Tuesday after that. I'm really excited about this. It's be I've actually cool. even written about it in the, in the column. Oh, Rock yeah. Yeah. Great magazine. Where are we? Great magazine. <laughs> yeah. You're not even on it. It's me. So. Oh. <laughs> Here you are now. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> oh. All right, Bevan, really good to have you on the program. Cool. Um, BevanJamesIsles.com. Yeah, get up to five, and if you are going to come along, we're going to early bird rate, so get onto it now. So get up to five.co.nz. Great. Thanks for coming to the program. Thanks, mate. Welcome back to the program, Jamie Goff. We haven't seen you for ages. It has been a while. We've been busy. It's Central been, City Plan yeah. and everything else. And everything else. Several weeks, in fact. Yeah. I'm going to say two months. I'm pretty sure that's the last time you're here. Latest CC Magazine is out today. Looks really you, good. Thank you. You're one of our contributors. 
It's looking good, eh? Yeah, it's a great magazine, so mm. I'm so happy to see it grow. <laughs> Thanks so much. Now, we do have a comment from you in there, but I'll, we'll talk to you about that in a minute. Now, I have heard whispers around town that you are getting involved in a boxing match. <laughs> yeah. Actually, more than whispers. I've seen it written down. Yeah, well, as you can see, you know, I'm the, the physique of a professional boxer, <laughs> um, but I've been lured into it, roped into it. Yeah. yeah. Sam Sakadeva from the press. Yeah, the local government reporter from the press. And um, you. Fighting. Fighting it out in the ring? Yeah, 25th of uh, November. For the so, Fight for Christchurch. Fight for Christchurch, and uh, my charity is to raise raise money. There's a group um, raising money for the victims of uh, or families from uh, hurt by the earthquake. Great. Affected, but it actually goes to the to the kids who lost their uh, their parents in the earthquake. Okay. So a great cause. And uh, you've always got to step out of your comfort zone, I think, sometimes. Yeah. So I, I've, um, I'm certainly not a fighter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there is some appeal in fighting the local government reporter from the press. <laughs> I know. I quite like to fight him as well. <laughs> it's just for fun. But I, I've seen some photos, actually, of um, the, um, you two having a drink on Friday night. Um, I'm not sure if you're actually supposed to be friends with them before you fight them. <laughs> Thoughts? <laughs> what do they say? Keep your friends close. Oh, your enemies close. True. No, it's uh, we actually uh, we had a couple of drinks on Friday after a big week for both of us, and uh, we we made a pact that we're each not going to drink until um, uh, until the 25th of November until the fight. Okay. So it's been about a week now of. Uh, abstinence from alcohol. <laughs> so my training has begun. Sam, mm -hmm. Sam is training. He, he's he's going to the gym and everything. I don't think I've run in about a year. Wow. So giving up drinking until the fight, uh, my, that's my training thus far. And so I'm well into it. Yeah, you are. <laughs> but I mean, you've never boxed before. No. He's never boxed before. No. But he's lost a lot of weight, yes. hasn't he? So yeah, he would have been in the gym. He's so... actually a bit heavier than me as well. He's closer to 80 kgs and I'm around 70 kgs. Yeah. So we've sort of got to meet somewhere in the I middle there. I think you need to put on five kilograms and he has to lose five. I think so. Yes. So, well, that could be more fun for me if, uh, you know, if that involves some Burger King or some other yeah. intensive training. Yeah, but just remember, protect the money maker, <laughs> and that's not, why I said no. <laughs> it's, not the money maker. it's not the money maker for me. Oh uh, yeah, your brain is. <laughs> but anyway, um, now let's just have a chat about what's going on in the council at the moment. City plan is out. Well, the draft. City the draft plan. central city plan. So, so the start of the conversation. Yeah. So what was it like just coming up with that draft city plan, being part of that? Uh, you know what, Kenita, I, I think my biggest fear throughout all of this, as you know, I went to San Francisco and we talked to a lot of the people involved in their recovery in 1989 from their earthquake. And the strong message was this had to be a bottom-up build. You had to mm. involve the community. My fear was that there would be too much that was already decided and people would try and do a bit of a reverse planning exercise. Mm. That was my cynical side. Mm. But I tell you what, through, through the, the weeks and weeks of sitting there early in the morning till late at night going through all of this, 106,000 ideas from Share an Idea, every single one of them read and incorporated and processed uh, to, to a certain extent. You know, there was a, we've seen the programs that they use, the software, it's just incredible mm. that each one of those ideas was, uh, was meticulously gone through and, uh, and categorised to try and involve it in the, in the plan to some extent. And this, I tell you what, is the biggest consultation, mm. for lack of a better word, because we're going to the consultation phase now. Mm. But as far as it goes from a, a bottom-up build to involve the community, it really is a document of that. So I've, I'm, I'm really blown away, pleasantly surprised. Mm. Okay. From the things that you learnt over in San Francisco, what have you actually, you and the other councillors, what have you really encouraged into this, this draft? Well, we, the main thing is it, it's all well and good to have my own ideas and I've got thoughts about some things and I've got experiences about other things that I bring to the table. But ultimately, it's not so much about what I want, it's about what the community wants. Mm. You know, and I've said to you before, outside of uh, local government, central government, insurance, money, if, if there isn't that community buy-in and there isn't that desire to invest, mm. you may as well not do a rebuild because mm. that's who you're rebuilding it for. So there's got to be that buy-in there from the community. Mm. They've got to really have a sense of ownership with what you're doing. And I think the draft central city plan does that to a certain extent. You know, it incorporates a heck of a lot of ideas from a wide spectrum mm. uh, and, and really puts them in paper in a cohesive manner. Mm. You know, and also fixes a lot of the cracks that existed beforehand, mm. which is an opportunity that we never would have had if the earthquake hadn't have happened. So all I hope for is that we can make positives out of the horrible situation that we went through. Mm. And it's just the start. Mm. We've collated this and now the community needs to say whether or not we've got it right, what they like, what they don't like, and changes will be made from that to further refine it. Mm. I know it's only been released to the public just recently, but have you had any feedback from people? Have, has anybody said anything to you yet about what they're I have, thinking? actually, yes. Mm. Uh, I've, I put it on Facebook, mm. on my uh, Facebook uh, yeah. page straight afterwards and yeah. there's been a whole lot of positive comments. Um, 
I think probably about three or four people that I've run into, even waiting uh, to come onto the show here when they make me pretty beforehand, <laughs> uh, even had a conversation about that. Mm. And, and uh, I, I went out to a, um, to a function last night, and it, it's it, that's the topic of the town at the moment. Yeah. Everyone's just saying, "Hey, look, we, we just can't believe the amount of the ideas." You know, there's there's some sort of wacky ones that you see at Share an Idea mm. that came through, and some of those, you know, that they, they ummed and out about them, and some of the more uh, radical ones weren't didn't quite make the cut. Yeah. But you know, there's, there's a lot of ones that came through that were never really uh, f in the forefront of the council staff's mind, such as you know the low-rise city, all these sorts of things. Mm. Um, free Wi-Fi was never something that council staff were, were hammering on about. Mm. But you see all of this came through very, very strongly from the Christchurch public and, uh, and found its way into the draft central city plan. So the feedback I've had has been really good so far. Excellent. You know, it's right. never going to be 100% great. Yeah. All right, we, we'll catch up with you in a couple of weeks and just see if you can chat more about what you wrote about in your Colin and CC. All right, then. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for coming the program. We'll be back after this break. You're back with City Life. I'd like to welcome David from ECAN. Good to have you here. Okay. Now, tell me about your role at ECAN. Yeah, so I'm acting manager of personal services at ECAN. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the emerge, the bus exchange that's coming to Christchurch. What's in there at the moment for a bus exchange? So we put two temporary interchanges in, one on Believ and one on Hagliev, uh, immediately after the, the February earthquake. Um, and uh, we've got a shuttle service that runs between those two uh, interchanges. Um, yeah, so, so they've been very temporary. Mm -hmm. They were only ever intended to, to be there for a month, perhaps two at the, at the most. So it's a, it's a relief to have a, a new site mm -hmm. um, that the city's found for us. Yeah. Okay. What's it been like working from temporary sites at the moment? Oh, it's very, very difficult for staff um, and very difficult for customers as well. You know, this, the shelter's been substandard. Uh, and obviously, if, if people want to make a journey across town, they've had to uh, change multiple times. Uh, and I think from our operational point of view, it's been extremely difficult because uh, we haven't been able to get reliability back into the network because there's been a natural constraint over the size of the, the two interchanges. So uh, the, the new interchange is bigger. Uh, it'll allow more, more buses through, through it, um, which will enable us to get that reliability back for people. And I believe that the emergency earthquake law is being used to set up this temporary bus exchange, is that right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh, and, and the idea behind it is that it will uh, allow a bit of immediacy in terms of getting the, the interchange up. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been used a, a few times before. Uh, and I think most notably uh, with the Events Village in, in Hagley Park, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's probably attempting to circumvent a, a bit of the RMA process. Uh, but, you know, it's something that would have gone through anyway mm. uh, and it's, it's extremely necessary for it to, ha to have occurred. So. OK. Welcome. Tell me about the, the new bus exchange, or the temporary one. Where is it going? Yeah, so it's going between Lich Litchfield and Chewham Streets uh, and it's, essentially it's going to be two bus lanes. Okay. Uh, initially, uh, the, the buses will be all be coming in from, from the top end, from Litchfield Street, and uh, there'll be platforms uh, on both sides so that... Uh, People can can uh, flow in and out of it, uh, and they'll be they'll be going in both directions from Chewham Street. Uh, there's a few constraints around the traffic management side with Colombo Street being closed, but uh, over time we'll address those and uh, get some you know get some real flow going, and uh, it, it should be quite a success, I think. How long do, how long will this be in place for? At the moment, they're talking two years. Uh, it, it may well be longer. Uh, you know, we, we obviously have had an off-street interchange site, which we've uh, um, we've had good use of. And I think, you know, in the first year following the implementation of that site, uh, it, there was an increase in patronage of 23%. So um, we know that these off-street interchanges are, are big drivers for patronage. So, um, you know, it may be that it's a, it's a long-term outcome, uh, or it maybe that's a shorter-term outcome. We're not sure yet. Um, okay. Um, and but the passenger numbers have dropped 50% since February. That's right. On average, it would be a, around 50%, uh, and that's you know largely been because people have had to take uh, you know multiple journeys, if you like. Mm. Um, and, and of course, there's there's an element where people have had to change their place of work, uh, you know, so that employees have relocated. Uh, so, you know, at the moment we are working on a, uh, a recovery plan that will align with the, 
the new interchange opening uh, and that will take in a number of those uh, employment centres where businesses have relocated to. So there'll be some changes to the network, I guess is what I'd signal okay. uh, over the next year uh, that you know could be quite significant. Um, ultimately, we'll want to head to a more hub and spoke type model where there'll be fewer buses going into the, the centre of the city, mm -hmm. um, but where people can actually interchange at, at suburban hubs around shopping malls and, and the like. So, okay. uh, so yeah, we've got some, some plans afoot there. What about the cost of setting up this temporary exchange? Yeah, the, the cost, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it is reasonably significant because of the curb and channelling that's been involved with it. Mm. Um, and and to, to enable access to the buses, the, the curbs have to be a certain height. Uh, there's obviously got to be a degree of infrastructure that's, that's used. Uh, but you know we're going to reuse a lot of the stuff. So like the real time equipment, the PA announcement stuff, um, that will all be reused if we get relocated somewhere else. So mm -hmm. it's not like it's a sunk cost that we we'll, we'll be spending in one hit. It's 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 like it's a cost that uh, we will be able to reuse elements of going forward. So we'll be able to offset a little bit of our expenditure. Okay. In the and um, the the site is clear ready, or is it? Yeah, the the, the buildings have been demolished. Um, and uh, we're now, a project manager has been engaged, um, so the City Council is working actively uh, on trying to uh, develop those bus lanes okay. um, and put the management structures in, in space, in, in place, you know, the traffic management side of things. Okay, yeah. so um, you say it's between Litchfield and Shoreham, is it between Colombo and Manchester? <coughs> is that that block there? It's um, where the old Katmandu store was. Oh, right. So, and, and it's next to the Rexel building, which uh, is where the City Council will be located. Okay. So it's going to locate staff there. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side of it, on the east side of the interchange, there'll be a whole bunch of car parks. Mm -hmm. um, part of, I guess, the, the revitalisation programme, the restart programme for the, for the CBD. So it's kind of a mix of buses and parking. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's not right on Colombo Street, but sort of set back to the west. Okay, it's Street. Durham Street that way. Yes, it's towards, oh, okay. towards Durham Street. Yeah. All right. Well, this is good. This is exciting. Something yes. happening in the city. That's good. Yes. Now, um, when is this up and running? Uh, at the moment, it's late late September is what okay. we're looking at. Uh, there's a lot of work for us, for both ECAN and the City Council to do uh, prior to that. Mm. Uh, and so there, there could be some slippage, but uh, we're hoping not. Um, obviously, with every lost patron we lose revenue mm. and uh, the order of magnitude of that is pretty significant so the sooner it can be put in place the better for us. All right David this is a good thing for the city thanks for coming to the program. Thank you. Finally on the program Ruth Todd here to talk about setting the stage for murder. Yes indeed. Tell me about that. <laughs> well next Sunday, Sunday the 21st, Sunday um, the 21st of uh, August at the Arts Festival. We're having um, the big Nao Marsh Crime Award for the best crime novel of 2010. And there are four New Zealand finalists. This is the second year mm -hmm. it's been, uh, and it's really promoting our crime writers because they're not well enough known in New Zealand. And mm. we have uh, three international, four international judges mm. who are blown away by these books. And we have our local writer, Paul Cleave, who's doing very well in Europe. In fact, I think one of his books is going to be made into a film. And a lot of people in Christchurch don't even know he exists. Blood Men is his book. We have Neil Cross, who writes for BBC, scriptwriter, who now lives in Wellington, very good writer. And we have uh, Paddy Richardson from Dunedin. And the last one is Alex Bosco, who we don't know who he or she is oh. because uh, she or he hasn't come out yet. But... Um, uh, she won it, he or she won it last year anonymously and we weren't too happy about that <laughs> because it was a bit of an anticlimax yeah. and she's in the finals, or she or he, I don't know, yeah, yeah, in the finals this year and apparently um, it's going to be made public this week before really? it, at last. That's yes, really that exciting. Fascinating? Yes, it is. So what's that like for you in the, the writing circles to, <laughs> to know that there's someone out there? Is it a real I name or is it a believe. It's, yeah. it's a pseudonym yeah. and I mean, only her publisher and her agent, are, I'm saying her. Yeah, you are saying her. I, I'm I, thinking I, you know. I don't. I yeah. don't. And I cannot believe. I think um, the person is in the media or okay. writes in another way, another right. genre. Okay. And there's a rumour going around who it might be. And I, But, I, you know, it's, it has been kept a very 
good secret. This is really exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. This is like a crime novel. <laughs> it is. And we didn't think um, the person, you know, I, w I was really sad that the person was in the finals again, you know, mm. I didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> but this is... Because you're still reeling from last year, aren't yes, you? Yes, I am. Mm. And um, there's a bit of regret on the person's part, apparently, that they didn't come. Mm. and come to the finals. Okay. So it certainly was an anticlimax. So that's exciting. That is really exciting. And this is all between 11 and 1. And at 11 o'clock um, in the Telstra Club, mm -hmm. at the uh, Arts Festival, at 11 we're having Tess Gerritsen and John Hart from the States, two top crime writers. Tess Gerritsen I really like. She's written about three novels. She's a doctor turned crime writer. Sort of not Kathy Reichs, but um, goes into the anatomy of people and bones and things more. You know, very. Mm. Um, she's Chinese American, and this book is apparently um, quite um, quite autobiographical. Okay. John Hart's fairly violent, a lot of violence in his books, but seen as one of the top American writers. I haven't had read his book yet, mm -hmm. um, and um, the title of. Um, Tess is just escaping me, which is really bad. But people <laughs> right. need to come and right. hear her. Yes. Do you know what? It makes me want to go and just see who this Alex person is. I know, I know. We're hoping that. Yeah. So I'm hoping that it's going to be all over the media mm. in the next few days. So 11 till 1? Yes, 11 to 12 will be the internationals. Right. Okay. And then we'll have 10 minutes break, people to buy books and things and mm. grab a drink. And, um, and then about quarter past 12 till 1 o'clock, We'll have the four finalists. Right. I, I think it's it's a really important award. It's going to become more and more important because crime writers in this country are really not known enough. Mm. They're very, very good. Mm. They're selling overseas and, you know, they need to be up there. And having it called the Nio Marsh Award mm. means it's really special to Christchurch. All right, it's mm. really exciting. Part of the Arts Festival, Sunday the 21st. OK, let's quickly talk about the Lanarks. The Lanarks, <laughs> Owen Marshall. First historical novel by this wonderful, wonderful... Uh, you can hold it yes, if you like. Yes, OK, we've only got about 20 seconds. Right, so. <laughs> it's just wonderful. It isn't from the point of William Lanark, the... Um, who everybody knows about, Lanark Castle. It's really about Connie, his third wife. He, his two wives died, and the and it, it's uh, the younger son, uh, Dougie, who lives there too. Okay. And it's their stories, yeah. and it's he's put fiction over fact, and it's a gem. Okay. Love it. All right, Ruth. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Planes, Planes FM. Yes. How's your program all going? All go. All go. Saturday yes. morning. Saturday morning, ten o'clock. Excellent. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> That is City Life for today. You can get in touch with us. You can email me, kaneta at ctv.co.nz. You can call us, 377 33 and you can write to us, PO Box 1100 Christchurch. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow.